At Goulburn, in response, they've taken to what is known as ethnic clustering. Yard 6 has the Asians, Yard 7 the Islanders, Yard 8 the Arabic prisoners, and in varied yards, the many Aborigines. Separating the different ethnic groups requires close management. Even food is isolated. Intelligence is gathered to identify ringleaders who are moved away from their power base. But the gang problem in jail is under control because we've got that capability of movement. Some of these young people that are coming off the street now, it's the first time in their life where they've been made do what someone else wants them to do. They have no say if we open their cell door at 11 o'clock at night and say you're moving from Lithgow to Goulburn because you're going to get yourself into trouble if you stay here any longer. If you'd have talked to superintendents two or three years ago, they would have said gangs are one of the biggest problems they've got in modern day prison in New South Wales. And now that's not the case. I think you need to go beyond that and, 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 and redress um, you know, the causes of, of disturbance and the feelings of hostility between different groups. I think in the longer term, particularly when people are released, it's undesirable. I think it is subject to abuse and the possibility of it being utilised by, by prison authorities to, to, to pay off debts or square off and so on. And I think it's just, as I say, a capitulation to the problems rather than an attempt to deal with them. When the ethnic clustering policy was introduced in 2001, New South Wales had the highest prisoner-to-prisoner -prisoner violence in Australia. Within the confines of the cell blocks, where suspicion and treachery rule more severely than the guards, many inmates believed it was all a plot, that violence was orchestrated and the clustering was a means of restricting them from work and education. They want them to be guarded vegetables, believe me, brain fucked, you know, dysfunctional people, inmates because they're easier to manage. Once you start teaching them things, start learning, giving them opportunities and exercising their brain, then they become um, dangerous in their mind because they, they feel insecure, seriously. But the policy did have one inescapable benefit. It was necessary since we did it in 1998 there hasn't been a repeat murder. The next outbreak of violence, as it turned out, had serious consequences for the guards. According to Christopher Binns, separation of Aborigines and Arabic inmates had generated tension. Uh, the Lebanese were a little bit disappointed. The Kuris were a little bit disappointed because their friendship with the Lebanese and what they were able to offer was uh, reduced, so they weren't they weren't happy. They weren't impressed. So they thought, "Oh, we'll make a statement. Fuck you, you know. We'll take it. We'll run the ball up." And then they run the ball up. The jail never rioted. One small wing of Aboriginal inmates rioted, and that was generated by a core hard group of inmates who had nothing to lose. In April 2002, in this cell block, prisoners attacked staff with table legs and a didgeridoo. These images were captured soon after. Seven male and female officers were injured. One, Timothy Swain, suffering serious brain damage. Officers got hurt. Was yeah. that right that they got hurt? I don't, listen, I, don't, I can only I answer for myself. You know, I speak for myself, I can't speak for others. You know, I don't like to see these things happen. Um, and I like to see no one get hurt. You know, but you know, we live in a, a, a society where it's pretty, in Goulburn society, is, uh, is just ruthless. The disturbance was broken up by the jail's immediate action team, ever watchful in the wings. Their job is not for the faint-hearted. That particular one there, Chris, is just a, a metal spike. And they were taken out of mattress spaces uh, in the jail here. And as a result of that, of course, we had to um, replace uh, over 400 beds with um, solid frame mattress spaces. And something like this? I mean... Arming up for offensive or defensive purpose has become a prison routine. The most common weapon 
a sharpened toothbrush. We've got pocket grenades here. The riot response teams carry very different weapons. The principal leveller used when they rush outnumbered into the yards is this capsicum spray. We've also got um, <coughs> these aerosols, same product, so yes, um, mainly used for if we need an instant um, reaction, say a big fight in the yard. They're not breaking up, this gas vest never goes in the yard, but every other operator carries these. So you just pull the pin out, squirt, nine times out of ten, fight's over. They train constantly. Prison officers in prison garb confront the men the prisoners have come to know as the gang squad. If you can introduce chemical agents into a situation when it escalates to force being used, you minimise injuries to both sides, to the inmates and to staff, and particularly staff. I don't want my staff being knocked around. They don't get paid enough money to be punching bags for thugs. He has to come out of this doorway with his hands on his head and he'll be met by men in black. Over. The New South Wales Corrective Services Department has grown an even stronger arm with its hostage response measures. With Alpha One, team will enter. One. Back. <laughs> Two. Even office staff are taught the fundamentals of self-defence. So why do they need these skills? Well, uh, the officers obviously need them because they're dealing with the inmates on a day-to-day -day basis, as, long as, as well as the nurses um, in the clinics, in the, in the centres. Probation and parole, they actually go out to uh, houses, for offenders' houses, and they're sort of out there on their own without any sort of support or backup. The men in black undertake intense hostage negotiation training as well as close combat. The work is taken seriously. Snipers are trained to shoot to kill. Chris, it's called a cold barrel shot. Of course, if a marksman or a sniper, if you will, um, has to use lethal force, that's the conditions that they would use it under, and they're trained on that and have to submit targets every month. Um, but that's the absolute worst case scenario. We would only use lethal force to avoid um, somebody else being killed. I think that the, the ramping up of security, the resources devoted to security, the ramping up of the, the, the riot squads, the increased equipment, the, the increased number of cell searches and so on, there's a much stronger control that's operating within the prisons at the moment than there certainly was in, in the, the pre-naval period. Now we have an era where the department for the first time is run by experienced correctional administrators and I think we have a good balance now. We don't have the issues of food um, and conditions that we had in the 1970s. Escort OIC from 2IC, Pol Air requests our location, over. Escort OIC to Pol Air, escort approximately one zero minutes from Zulu 1, over. OIC from 2IC, Pol Air copied last, over. The stronger arm has also meant escapes in New South Wales have been all but arrested. The weakest link, the movement between prisons and courts, has been strengthened to a point where it would take a small army to break an inmate out as they are delivered to Goulburn. Having ended up in the forerunner to Supermax and having escaped from maximum security prisons twice, Christopher Binns is an expert on the subject. What about the HRMU, the Supermax? Is that unbreakable? I'd say it would be. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty uh, secure, that place.
Once inside the outer perimeter, the van passes into a second prison, the HRMU, the High Risk Management Unit, better known as the Supermax. Okay, what I'm going to do is perform a regulation strip search, you understand? Yep. What I want you to do is do exactly what I tell you to do. Don't get in front of me. If I tell you to stop, stop what you're doing, wait for further instructions, yeah, you understand that? Do. Take your overalls off, turn them inside out. Very few inmates see this place. Indeed, this is the first time cameras have broken in since it began operating in 2001. The Supermax is home for 34 of Australia's 24,000 prisoners. What will greet them in their two by four metre cell is plastic plates and cutlery, a bunk, a sink and toilet. In time, they may earn the right to a television set and only in this way, perhaps, learn of the pedigree of fellow inmates. Malat was given the harshest sentence possible for the seven murders, jailed for the term of his natural life. The total sentences is 613 years plus 20 natural life sentences. That's natural life. And those 20 life sentences are shared between seven inmates. The 18-year-old was shot by Bassam Hamzi in what Justice Virginia Bell described as a killing of considerable callousness. The trial heard how 25-year-old Brendan Fernando and his 27-year-old cousin Vesta Alan Fernando abducted Miss Hoare, assaulted her, then killed her. They're the worst of the worst. They're the people who present the most extreme risk to security and safety in our system. We were not allowed to interview prisoners who, as it turned out, preferred to keep their distance. We were able to interview staff. How do they treat you? The inmates. They're like everybody. They have their good and bad days. I've been called everything under the sun. Other days, I'll, they will apologise to me for swearing or saying something inappropriate around me. Do they threaten you? I have been threatened, yes. It doesn't happen on a daily basis. Even though the inmates are housed here and they've, some of them have committed terrible crimes, they're still people. And initially you're apprehensive around them. While they get to know you, you get to know them. But once you've worked them out to a degree, their management's quite simple. Since the discovery of a mobile phone smuggled in by a corrupted prison officer in 2003, everything entering the Supermax, including the food, is scrutinised. So why are you searched too? Because we make no exceptions, Chris. It demonstrates to the staff that there's no special circumstances, there's no compromise on security. So every single staff member? Every single staff member, the commissioner, the minister included. One thing that happens to you, of course, is that in some respects you treat it like an inmate too. You're, you're searched. Do you resent that? Initially I did. I found it quite an invasion of my personal space and privacy, but I came quickly. You know, I'd always felt that the more we do to prove ourselves to be honest and professional and transparent, um, the better off we are in the long run. Now Chris, this is what we uh, call a safe cell. The prisoner's own term for the HRMU is the harm you. It's a short-term placement for inmates whilst they're a great threat to themselves of self-harm or suicide. Has uh, diagonally opposed cameras that are monitored all the time. Has uh, no hanging points whatsoever. Uh, even the blanket cannot be torn, cannot be made into a noose. The complaints that have filtered out speak of little natural light and too much time in cells. A minimum of 16 hours and a maximum of 22 hours per day is spent alone. 